Thank you, brother. I want to speak to you for a minute tonight from the scripture about some uh, things I think are very important. When you go back and look in the Bible and see what the Lord commended, I mean, he specifically commended these things. In other words, he spoke well of them. And um, the, uh, the lesson to be learned is, 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 is great. Look at Luke chapter 21 and verses 1 through 4. Luke 21, verses 1 through 4. He looked up, saw the rich men casting their gifts to the treasury, and he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. <clears throat> and he said, Of a truth I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For in all these have of their abundance cast into the offering of God, but she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. Father, I pray that you bless your word now as it goes forth. Amen. That's quite remarkable because the Lord never judges anything by the amount. He judges it by the motive. That's exactly right. Not the amount, but the motive. And this dear soul was giving everything that she had uh, to the Lord. Now, there's a lot of ways to give something to the Lord. Believe me. Some of you support these little orphans in Haiti. That's a good thing. I hope, uh, I hope a lot of you that do have thought about what you're doing. More of you might want to. You can support an orphan. You can give a certain amount of money or little children down there to feed them in Haiti. You can also support little children at St. Jude's Hospital that Danny Thomas started that have cancer. Uh, that's one of the most noble things in this country to support these kids that are being treated for cancer. They don't turn any child away. They treat them. Uh, Sonny Dix in the, in the Philippines has an orphanage, and he feeds little children. And he told us one time how that when he got up and preached to us, how that he went out into the streets there in Manila, places like that, and they had trash heaps, trash piles. And Manila is not the only place like that. And the little children were eating from the garbage that they could find there. And his wife told about how she had rescued one little child brought it into her home, just a little thing, and it eventually died, and it broke her heart. She has a heart for them. There's a lot of things that you can do, but here's the point. You get yourself personally involved in helping someone, and you are going to receive far more than you give. Giving, when you give, you are manifesting the Spirit of Christ. For he said it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. He commended this. He commended this widow. Now, uh, they say that these two mites aren't worth much more than about two cents. So, I mean, how many buildings can you build with two cents? It's not the buildings. It's not the extravagance. It's not the put on. It's not the facade. It's the heart. When the people get their heart right with God, they will give. There's no way you can look at a table spread with food and the homes that we live in and the vehicles we drive and all we have. And if you're not thankful for it, then it's a good indication that you've got a hardened, callous heart. Oh, sure, you believe everything you're supposed to believe. Just like the Mennonite Mafia that I was preaching about Sunday. You still wear your handmade clothes. You've got all of your, your, your bonnets and all of this stuff that you make, you know. And in all appearances, you appear to be this separated Christian. But inside, you're dead. You're a wolf. You're, you're a drug runner. Now, remember... I'm not condemning all Mennonites. There's a lot of Mennonites out there. The vast majority of Mennonites out there no doubt probably love the Lord. But this group, Mennonite Mafia, I wish that you'd check me out when I say stuff like this. Go home and say, what's that preacher talking about? Type it in. Check me out. And you'll be amazed at what you pull up about the Mennonite Mafia. The drug runners that run drugs from, Cal from uh, Mexico on up to the north. So, you know, separation is not in what you have on. And it's sure not when you strip yourself down naked in front of people. You can go extremes in either direction. Separation is of the heart. But when the heart gets right, the flesh will follow suit. It's always like that. But you can't, how can you be right with God and see the suffering they say that in, uh, I forget where it was, somewhere I, I read it today, 
uh, they had a job fair somewhere. They were offering jobs, and the lines were wrapped around building after building after building after building. People standing in line. Where? Amazon. That's what it was, Amazon. People standing in line to get a job. Everybody's not living on the mountain. Everybody's not rich, you see. Everybody, they don't have, uh, they're, not, they're not entitled. So uh, she gave all she had. Why'd she do that? Because she knew her living was not in the money she had in her hand. She knew her living came from the blessing of God. And she returned to him what he had given to her. And he commended her for that. Amen. What can you build with two cents, preacher? Care what you got your, about your two cents. What can you build with a heart that's right with God? That's what you build. And that's what matters. Over here in Luke chapter 16. In Luke chapter number 16 and verses 8 through 9. I'm going to tackle, I'm going to tackle a hard scripture for you this, uh, this evening. All right? I'm going to tackle it. Luke chapter 16 verses 8 and 9. The Lord commended the unjust steward. Because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Anybody want to take a shot at that? <laughs> That's tough scripture, right? Amen. How many long, how many 30 minute messages you ever heard preached on that one? All right. Now let me give you a, let me give you a take from a brother here. And here's what he says. Jesus states that we are to make friends for ourselves by the means of the mammon of unrighteousness. The material resources that the Lord has entrusted to us should be used as a tool to benefit other people and make friends. This is the idea behind the phrase mammon of unrighteousness. What he's saying is, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, right? Filthy lucre, right? But it doesn't, uh, that's, the general con, that's the general idea of what money represents to most people. And you have in your hands, you've got in your wallet right now, in your pocket, you've got money in there that bought drugs. You understand that? You've got money in there that was probably used to pay prostitutes with. Are you following me? The money you've got in your hand, how many of you have any idea tonight where all that money's been? Well, you have no idea, Right? In the hands of the wrong person, that money could be used for anything. So it's called the mammon of unrighteousness. But we as stewards of the Word of God and as stewards of what God's given us can take that and use it for the glory of God. And people are going to watch the way we use it. They're going to watch the way we use it. Is it for you? And for your own personal, uh, is, in other words, is it all about you or could someone else benefit from what you're doing? Like I said, St. Jude's Children's Hospital. You don't have to go out and broadcast it. But if you ever start supporting them, they'll send you a photograph every month of a certain child. And, that's, and they've got a calendar. They'll give you a 12-month calendar and you can paste that each month of some little child that you're helping. Then they'll give you an update as to how they're, how, how they're progressing with their cancer and so forth, you see, all right? Now, you can do that, and you don't have to stand on the street corner and, and, and broadcast what you're doing. But here's the bottom line. People have a sense about them. Notice, the children of the world have more, they have more, they have a better sense about them than, 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 than a lot of times than religious people do. Did you know that in Portugal, just in the last few hours, a Cessna 172, that's what I used to fly, a Cessna 172, lost his engine power and he came down on a beach. That Cessna came down on a beach, he killed two people. Now he could have ditched it in the water. He could have ditched it in the water, make no mistake about it, because he had enough glide and glide path there to put that in the water and not kill anybody. Did you know that the people over there on that beach we're going to drag him out. And they lived. The, the pilot and the, and, the, and the student lived. And the people called them murderers. A little eight-year-old girl got killed. And a 56-year-old man. And unrelated to each other. But you see, it was a selfish move on the part of that pilot to set that plane right down on top of those people and kill that little girl. And I wouldn't want to live with that the rest of my life, right? Okay, and the people 
were going to drag them out of that airplane and beat them right there on that beach, and the police were the only ones that stopped them from doing it. Why? If they had ditched it in the water, and even if they had hit somebody in the water, because sometimes waves you can't see, it would have been an entirely different situation because the people would have understood they tried their best to keep from hitting the people on the ground. Bottom line, they considered their lives, the pilot and, this, and the student, they considered their lives more important than the lives of, the, of, the, of that little child and the man that got killed. Here's the bottom line. The people know selfishness. The unrighteous, the unsaved, the unlearned, they know selfishness. And that's what the Lord's talking about here. He's talking about the perception of the world as to how you handle your money and how you relate to them and what you do. All they understand out here in the world, most of them, is that the church is here to feed people. The church is here to help people. And if it has a social purpose in the world, then it has a justification for existence. They're not interested in your spiritual truths. The world doesn't care anything about if Christ is the Son of God, if the second coming, the rapture. They don't care anything about that. What they care about is what are, what are you doing to help your community? That's what the world sees. And that's, what's, that's the gist of what's going on here. The Lord said make friends of them in the sense that they understand that you do want to help people. And you do, don't you? That's what we're, that's what we're here for. We're not here to look pretty, smell good, and walk around and talk about our theology. We're here to give a witness and a testimony to this world. Notice what it says over here in the book of uh, Luke chapter 18. He commends again. Luke chapter 18, verse 5. Yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continuing, continual coming she weary me. I love people who don't quit. When I played basketball, rural high school, we had a sign and down in the, in the locker room, in the showers, it said, quitters never win. Period. Never win. There's nowhere to quit. You don't quit. And if anything made our coach mad, it was, if, say we're down 15 points and you got five minutes left, you're down 20 points, you've got five, to, five six minutes left, you know, and you just quit. Game's over. We've lost. Man, that made him mad. He wanted us to play till the final buzzer and give it everything we had because he hated quitting. And that's the way it is with Christ and to serve the Lord. This is what he's talking about here. He's talking about somebody that's going to pray. They're going to keep praying. They're going to pray. They're going to keep praying. They're going to pray. They're going to keep praying. They're not going to give up. It doesn't look like your prayer is going to be answered. It looks like the one you've prayed for for so long that there's not going to be an answer to your prayer. Keep praying. Keep praying. Keep praying. And notice what it says here. The master, which is a, which is a figure of the Lord, said they're going to worry me to death if I don't answer their prayer. Did you know that God cannot turn a deaf ear to your prayer? If you are right with God, he cannot and will not turn a deaf ear to your prayer. I'm glad for that, aren't you? Hallelujah. Keep praying. Now over here in the book of Matthew chapter 15, verse 28, he commends the Syrophoenician woman, a, a Gentile, pagan. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it to thee uh, even as thou wilt. Her daughter was made whole from that very hour. He commended her for her great faith. And what was her great faith in? She didn't know anything about the Messiah of Israel. She knew nothing about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She probably didn't know the Pentateuch existed. She didn't know anything about the Jewish religion. She didn't know any of that. All she knew was, here's a man. I've heard something about that man. I believe what I've heard about that man. And I believe that man can do something for my little girl. That's what she knew. And she followed the light she had and God blessed her because of that. Amen. He blessed her because of it. That's a wonderful thing. That's a principle that runs from Genesis through Revelation. You follow the light you've got. God will bless you and give you more light. Amen. Light is coming to the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. The Bible said he's the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Who? The Lord Jesus Christ is the light of the world. 
Not the Baptist faith. Not the Christian church. No, it's not. It's Christ. This is why Paul said to the church at Corinth, I came knowing nothing among you but Christ and Him crucified. I've listened to preaching and I've listened to them and I've said to myself, where's Christ? You listen to some of these people for 30, 45 minutes and you hear, and you hear about this, you hear about that, you hear about this, that, this, that, but you don't hear anything about the Lord Jesus. And He is what it's all about. Amen. Amen. Meet me, forget me, you've lost nothing. Meet him, forget him, you've lost everything. It's not about me. Luke chapter 17, verse 18. There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger, the Samaritan. The Samaritan. There was a good Samaritan in Luke chapter number 10, the Syrophoenician woman. Have you noticed a principle here developing in the book of, uh, in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? He's showing them that the greatest faith that he encounters while he's here in the flesh is, is manifested by pagans. The greatest faith comes from, from, from uh, Samaritans, Syrophoenicians, Greeks. They came, the Greeks came one day and said, we would see Jesus. The greatest faith that he commends to the people comes from the pagan. Isn't that something? He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed, folks. Nothing has changed. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. That has a double application. He was lifted up as the, as the Savior of mankind at the cross. But if you'll preach him in lifting up, live him before the people, lift him up in your life, he will draw all men unto himself. That's what's going on here. The Samaritan leper returned with thanks. Where are the nine? He said. This is the only one that came back. Matthew chapter number 16 verse 17. The Lord commends Peter for saying this. Jesus answered, said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. That tells me that there are things that scholarship will never teach you. There are places that the professor can never take you. There are things that can only be learned directly from God if you're willing to receive them. And the revelation, revelation, revelation doesn't come by human, human ability and human achievement. Revelation comes from God. He reveals it to the soul of a man. Yes, he does. Revelation. When Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, he didn't get that from the Pharisees. He sure didn't get it from the Sadducees. He sure didn't get it from the Romans. Where did he get it? He got it from God. When did he get it? He got it by listening to the Lord. <coughs> That's where it came from. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You all believe that tonight? You know something, folks? That's what it's all about. If we don't get that right, forget the rest of it. He's the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what he said. That's what Peter said. That is the foundation of Christianity. That's the foundation of our faith, is the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we get the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ wrong, it's, it's irrelevant. Whether you're premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial, what kind of polity you have for your church, what kind, of, uh, what kind of worship service you have, that's all meaningless. If you don't get Christ right, none of the rest of it matters. Amen. So he said that. Over here in the book of Luke chapter 10, he commended Mary, the sister of Lazarus. But one thing is needful, speaking to Martha, Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Have you noticed that when uh, Brother uh, 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 was just with us, from North, he's from South Carolina, Taylor, Milton Taylor, when Brother Taylor, how many times have you heard him say, I love to study? You know, last time he was here, he told me back there in the back, he said, I got thousands of books. He said, I got all kinds of books. He said, I got books everywhere. All these books he has. He loves to get in there and study. He loves to read them. He does. He loves to read them. He loves to read these books. Do you know why? He wants to get something from God. 
Now, you can get something from God by reading books. You can get something from God by when you open up your soul and really get honest with the Lord. And that's the hardest thing for us to do. It's hard for people to do that. When you open up, I had a lady tell me one time, she said, I even got down on my knees and talked to God about it. I thought to myself, lady, do you have a clue what you just said to me? In a week's time, how many times do you get down on your knees? I hope you do. <laughs> it wouldn't hurt you to fall prostrate every once in a while. Crawl up under a rock or a bush or something. No, oh, I'm too proud for that. That's the problem. Somebody's liable to see me. Yeah, that's the problem. Get down as low as you can get and cry out to God. You see, you want to hear something from the Lord, don't you? Well, get him on your mind and on your heart all day long. This business of setting aside a time for the Lord is a bunch of junk. His time is all time. Now, you may set aside a time to study. You may set aside a time, something like that. That's fine. But his time is from the time you take your first breath in the morning until you go down and lay your head down at night. You don't have a time during the day, well, I'm secular for a while. Now I'm going to be religious for a while. That's a bunch of garbage. That's why Paul said, pray without ceasing. Have your heart in that spirit of prayer when you talk to the Lord. And it's so important because that's where you get the good part. She sat at his feet. Now, she was smart too. So how do you know that? Because she knew he wouldn't be around forever. I mean, what if you knew, what if you knew you had 10 days with the Savior and then he'd be gone? Uh, would you plan a vacation during that 10-day 10 10 period of time and, you know, spend a day or two with him? Or would you spend all 10 days? Would you take every waking moment that you possibly had and then, and then every possible moment you'd be at his feet? Some of those people, and Mary was one of them because she anointed him, she knew he would be going to a cross and there give himself for her sins and everyone else's sins and he would no longer be here in the flesh and she redeemed the time. Amen. Amen. I've had the privilege in the few years that I've been saved to be around some men and listen to some men and most of them are gone now that I had great respect for. I respect them. Now they're gone, and you can't call them back. You can't do anything about it. They're here for a while, and they're gone. And so you redeem the time. You need to do that. You need to, be, you need to get serious about getting that good part. What does God have to say to you today? Get in His Word. Talk to Him. Pray to Him. Commune with Him. Remember, a man is the only creature that can commune with God. I heard a preacher the other day. I was listening to him. He comes out of Louisiana. And he said something. And he, and he, uh, he, was, talking about, he was talking about man. He was talking about God. And he said, did you know what? He said, man, I think this is what he was saying, is the only creature that can love God. I thought, good for you, brother. God bless you. Have you ever heard another preacher say that? And he said, man is the only creature that can love God. Think about it. Gabriel, nowhere it says he loves him. Michael, nowhere it says he loves him. Cherubim and seraphim, nowhere does it say they love him. No angel in the scripture is ever said to love God. Nothing in the Bible is ever said to love God but you. So when God communes with you and Mary sat at his feet wanting that good part, she looked up at him and she loved him. And he knew she loved him and, and he loved her. And they exchanged that love between the two of them. That's communion, folks. Koinonia. The Greek word koinonia means to have two things in common, to have it in common. You love him and he loves you. Don't take that lightly. Don't take it lightly. He put the capacity in you to love God. And he loves you in return. And only a man, only mankind can love him. And there's many more things that only a man can do. But we'll just stick with that one tonight. In the book of Luke chapter 10 verse 36, the good Samaritan, notice, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor to him that fell among the thieves? He said, he that showed mercy on him. 
Then said Jesus to him, Go and do thou likewise. <clears throat> do you know what the subdivision you live in? How do you know the name of the person who lives on one side and the name of the one who lives on the other? Some do, most don't. You can go down two houses, if you're living in a subdivision or whatever, you can go down two houses, usually in that neighborhood, unless you've been there a long time, and they've been there a long time, and you don't have a clue who they are. There was a time when neighbors depended on each other. They had to. That's just the way things were. They had to depend upon each other. Now, neighborly or neighborhood no longer has the same meaning that it used to have. The Lord is describing who's my neighbor. That's what he's talking about. That's what the Good Samaritan is about. Your neighbor. In other words, it doesn't have to be someone living right next door to you. It could be some soul that you see that has fallen on hard times. They need help. They need a touch from God. And they need to be lifted up from the mess they're in. Drug addiction is sweeping our nation. I watched a documentary the other day on Flacca. How many have ever heard of Flacca? It's hard to believe unless you see it yourself. This fellow runs at full speed as hard as he can go, lowers his head, and rams it right into the window, the driver's side window of an automobile. And that's safety glass. Knocks him cold. He falls back on the ground, rolls around. You got one screaming and yelling and kicking like an animal. You got people doing all kinds of crazy, weird stuff on Flacca. And you've got bath salts. Now you've got an opioid addiction problem. And they're coming out and they're telling people, you got all these people addicted to drugs. Then you've got places like Colorado. That pa Colorado and I think Washington State, Oregon, one or the other, passes a law that legalizes marijuana. And anybody that knows anything knows that marijuana is a gateway drug. What's that mean? That means when you start on marijuana, you're eventually going to wind up going to something stronger. Not to mention the fact that a marijuana smoke is loaded with carcinogens just like cigarette smoke. In other words, it can give you lung cancer. It can kill you. So what are you doing? Well, the society is thumbing its nose in the face of God. They're telling the Lord, we know better. Well, you don't know better. One day you'll pay a heavy price. I've watched people cough up blood. I've watched them when they try to breathe. <gasps> they can't get breath. I've watched them as they've suffered with lung cancer, emphysema, COPD, uh, chronic bronchitis, and emphysema. I've watched them as they go through all of this stuff. It's a horrible thing to watch somebody after 30, 40, 50 years, after they've abused their body, when they start to die. You say, well, you got to die from something. Well, there's a whole lot. I'll tell you a good way to go. Let me tell you how a good way to go. How many want to know what a good way to go is tonight? Here's a good way to go. Let your heart stop. No pain. First thing you know, you start getting dizzy. And the next thing you know, you don't know. <laughs> You're gone. In just a few seconds. That's a good way to go. Heart stop. That's all. Just stops beating. No pain, folks. I've been there three times. No pain. That's a good way to go. And I've watched people die from pancreatic cancer. That's one of the most horrible deaths a person can suffer. It is horribly painful. Cancer of the pancreas. It's horrible. Horrible. And so we're with this stuff is coming on people and they think, well, that's no big deal. I'll handle it when it comes down the pike. You might, you might not. You might not be ready. And more than likely won't be. So the uh, good Samaritan fell among thieves. The neighbor did. And when the neighbor fell among thieves, he went over and showed him mercy. In Luke chapter number 7, I'll close with this one tonight. The Roman centurion was commended. He said, I also am a man set under authority, having unto me soldiers. I say to one, go. He goeth to another, come. He cometh to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. <coughs> The Roman army, the Roman army was one of the most disciplined armies that ever existed. A legion, six, seven thousand men, it depended on whether it's the Republic or the Empire, they changed sizes, but let's just say a legion of six or seven thousand men. 
many times defeated 20 and 30,000. Why? Because they were disciplined. Why? Because their commanders put those men in a situation to where you don't obey orders, we're going to make an example out of you, and you're going to pay for it with your life. They would not hesitate to take one of those soldiers and use him as an example before the rest of them. You know where the word decimate comes from? That's every tenth soldier. Every tenth. To decimate means to take the every tenth, take him out, and use him as an example. That's where you decimate something. It comes, of course, as always, when it comes down into your language centuries later, it doesn't really have the meaning that it that originally meant. But that's what it means. So the centurion was responsible for a hundred soldiers. Their lives were in his hands. They answered to that centurion. And if he said go, they, get, they went. If he said stop, they stopped. And whatever he told them to do, they did it because they were, they were well disciplined. He looked at the Lord Jesus Christ and he said, you're that kind of authority because you've got authority with God. And if you say something, it's going to happen because God has given you that kind of authority. And I'm going to appeal to your authority. I say to a man, go, he goes. And I know if you say it, it's going to happen. And the Lord Jesus Christ heard him say that. And he said, I haven't seen such great faith as that. He said, go, your servant's healed. And you know the story. When he got there, he inquired of what hour his servant was healed. It was the very same hour that Christ said it was. That's when it happened. Just like that. Authority. Does Christ have authority? Absolutely he has authority. The Lord God Almighty has given the Son of God authority that no one else has. No one could be entrusted with that kind of authority. But he has it. He has it. And I'm thankful tonight for that. I'm thankful tonight that my life and my soul, my spirit and my future is not in the hands of a man. It's in the hands of the Lord Jesus. That's who I put my trust in. That's who you need to put your trust in tonight. Use your doctor. Trust the Lord. Doctor came out the other day. John had his surgery. And uh, I was there when he came out. He's a real nice fellow. I forget his name, but he, he was a vascular surgeon. And he was almost at the point of tears. He was saying, we've come a long way. And John has, uh, you know, has, John has deteriorated over this period of time. And, uh, and, and I've watched it, and I hate to see this happen to him. But he said, hopefully what we've done today is going to make a, make a, make a big difference in his life. And he was so personable when he was saying it, talking to the family, Sandra was there, Johnny and the rest of the family. He was talking personally to them. He wasn't speaking as some, some, uh, some detached uh, philosophical manner, you know. Have you, how many of you seen doctors that are, it's, it, you know, they're, they're, they're gracing you with their presence and their time? No. This man was personally involved. He cared. And you could tell he cared. And then he said something that I haven't, I don't know that I've ever heard another doctor say. He said, is there anything I can do for any of the rest of you? I thought to myself, that's quite a thing. A physician has just come out of surgery. Anything I can do for the rest of you? He cared, didn't he? He cared. He cared. And you thank God for doctors like that. Who does the healing? The doctor is a tool in the hands of the Lord. The Lord does the healing. So learn that. Learn that. Your life is not in the hands of the doctors, in the hands of God. The doctor is a minister used at that time for whatever God wants to use him for. Father, we pray that you'd bless your word tonight. Bless my brothers and my sisters. We come together in the name of Jesus. No greater name. No greater name. We bless his righteous holy name and lift him up and exalt him. In thy precious name we pray. And amen. All right, let's see here tonight. We've got... Uh, Debbie McLeod's going to be singing for us.